Okay, good morning, everybody. It's Peter here, and I'm from AJS, and it's my delight to welcome you this morning to Carney Burroughs. So uh, let's welcome Carney. And uh, Carney is coming to us from sunny Brisbane. And Carney, this morning we're talking about uh, designing a locket in 3D CAD software. Yeah. Um, what are we going to get up to this morning, Carney? Okay, today we're going to be making um, a little locket. So, like, demonstration model that we've got um now using a lot of the jewelry software programs uh they tend to be very expensive and sometimes they're a little hard to to kind of get to to get to know um so we're going to be making a fairly simple sort of like a, a sterling like this little locket like this one which i've already cast up here uh this one has got uh rare earth magnets on the inside which just makes it a little easier to open and close. A lot of people have difficulty with those, with, um, the more mechanical sorts of closures. So this one, we're just going to make it so that we can just slip those in. Now, you can make lots of variations on this locket. So once you've actually got it made and once you've sort of like followed along with it, Fusion 360, you can always get a small business license for it. So you can actually get free, free versions of it. Uh, you can just make it, once you've actually got it, you can add initials to the front of it. Um, using the program, you can download STL files from things like Thingiverse or Shapeways, and you can embed those into the front. But for the moment, we're just going to make just the basic locket, and then what we can do with it after that. That's Excellent. the plan. It's a very elegant little locket too, Carney. Comes yeah, up the it, yeah, um, I think this is what a lot of people are going to be getting for Christmas this year. I'm just going to make a whole bunch of their initials on this go, guess what? <laughs> this way I don't have to think. Just go, you're getting a locket for Christmas <laughs> or your birthday. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Put some little little gemstones or something in there. Yes. Or enamel it. Ah, there's, there, there's a whole new world of pain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can always put cloisonne on the front. Ah. So there's a few varieties of uh, CAD software you can use, but we're going to use Fusion 360. Yeah. So now you've uh, used a number of bits of software out there. Just tell us a bit about the advantages of Fusion 360. Well, the advantage of Fusion 360 is, first of all, you can get it for free. Um, its other advantage is that it, it's all, if you've used uh, Photoshop, which is also like another Autodesk product it's very very similar except you're working in 3d so if you're familiar with things like photoshop or illustrator this the the whole sort of um the way that it's set up uh will be very very familiar to you uh, a lot of it is very logical it, it allows you to, to turn things very easily in 3d just by using a gimbal in the top right hand corner so you can move things around and look at it from all angles really really easily as if you're actually turning it physically in your hand, uh, which a lot of the other software ones, if you want to look at things in 3D, you've really got to like use, like hold down control and then shift this or go to the zoom in the right hand side. And it, it's not quite as, um, as instinctive, whereas this is a lot easier to manipulate. You also don't need a lot of, a lot of mathematics. It measures everything out for you. It'll try and help you. So it'll link up lines for you. It'll make things symmetrical. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of the really hard work out of it just by by just assuming that you want lines which are crossing over to actually meet. So it's it's pretty easy to go with. A good thing is it can also at the end once you've got your file and you've got your, your little your little thing that you've made, you can render it in the same software. So you can show a representation. Go, oh, this is what it looks like in silver, and it will actually make an image saying this is what it would look like in real life, which is also easy to run. It can also export it in a whole bunch of different 3D files. So you can make it as an STL, an OBJ. You can take the original design. Uh, you can put it into a manufacturing mode where it would actually, if you wanted to send this off to a factory for mass production, it can actually help you draw out the blueprints, which would go to a manufacturing where they actually need the set designs. So it's, uh, it's used a lot by some um, architects as well. So they can actually do um, plans uh, if you need something with more detail. So you can use it to build engines. <laughs> <laughs> 
be building engines. We're just going to be building fairly straightforward little, little things. Um, and the good thing is, of course, with any of these 3D things is if you want to scale it up, it's just a matter of just scale, just hitting scale and just changing it. You can scale, make it bigger, you can make it smaller, and it's just that easy. You don't have to do anything very complicated at all. And then you can, the good thing is then you can send the file off to a foundry and they'll print it off for you and uh, then cast it. So then you get your actual solid thing in your hot little hand mm. at the end of it all. Well, that's the exciting bit, I'm sure. Yeah. It is. It's very exciting. And then you've just got to clean it up like every other casting. You just go, oh, no, why do I do this? Oh, look, I've managed to, like, file through my fingernail. Again, oh, all the fun stuff, all the really fun stuff. I'd like, I'd like a machine to be able to just do all the cleanup for me as well. But, yeah, that's not going to happen yet. Give, give another 20 years. Have a replicator like on Star Trek. That'd be great. Well, I'm sure in the first step your fingernails are going to be safe, Carney, because we're going to be going they inside are. the uh, software. So we would you are. like to share your screen and uh, take us for that tour? Absolutely. Okay, so let's go into our screen and... Okay, can you guys see that locket? And in a word, no. Oh, in a word, no. Okay, let me try that again. Okay, in other word, yes. Yay! That's what I like to hear. Okay, so this is what we're going to be making. So this is pretty, what, the way that it, it sort of sits in. Now you'll see over in the, this top right corner here, I've got this cube. Now that allows us to turn everything. Just by clicking onto that little cube, I can turn it all the way around, look at the bottom, do all these little translations. So when we do our design, will often tend to just pick an orientation. I tend to pick it from the top, just because of all those years of like maths teaching, you deal with the whole X, Y axis thing. So there's the X axis, there's the Y axis. And it just, it's just a little easier and more familiar to work with. If I were to actually open this up, it'll show you, this is where we're going to be making our rebates to put our rare earth magnets in, which you can then hammer set um, or gypsy set in. Or if you, if you absolutely have to, you could, you could use just glue. It's, it, it depends. I have a tendency to, to want to, um, to do a rub over setting there just to make sure that it's, it's like a, a little class here rather than just whacking in some glue. And then we just put the hinge in, which will go through in here. So all those bits have to be done after it's actually been uh, manufactured. But until then, we're just gonna start with a blank slate. So here's how it normally just opens up. We've got all of our little tools and things arrayed across the top here. We're going to be selecting solid mode, which means we're building solid surfaces. All the rest of these are a little bit more esoteric. Maybe we'll do those in, in future programs. And here's our little cube. So what we do is we twist that around until we've actually got top. Now, if you just click on top, it'll just do the fractional changes so you're looking directly downwards. Each of these little squares here represents one centimetre. So we're just going to zoom in because we're not going to be making anything big. We're going to be making something really quite small and relatively delicate. So this is a pretty good size that we can start with. The first stage of doing any of these sorts of things is to start with a sketch. Now, what we want is an oval shape. That's going to be the outside shape of our locker. If you want, though, if you could actually make a heart shape or a circle or whatever sort of a shape that you actually want on, on your locker, but they all start the same sort of way. So we're going to create our sketch. It's going to ask you to pick a plane. Now, this little thing here is saying we are facing this plane or planar face. And we click on that one because that's the one that we want to use. And now it's come up with a different sort of a, of a menu up here on the left. Now, these are all different sorts of shapes or things that we can do with our sketch. Don't worry too much about the constraints over here. What these do is they allow you to uh, get the program to do things like lock things into position or move this to make sure that this is always one millimeter bigger than this. So they're things that we can, that we can worry about later. For the moment, just for our locket, we can have a circle. We click on here under create. It's really more of an ellipse shape. So we're gonna go with an ellipse. Now, once we wobble over, it's gonna actually tell us to place a center point 
always good to put things right here in the origin. So use the origin as much as you can. And that's just place the first access point. So we want our piece to be probably, let's, let's say we want it to be about 30 centimetres, something like that. And we wait until it's stretched out to 30 and we just click. And now it's going to say, how wide do you want it? So let's go with something like 20. So there's our shape. It's, it's you know, it's, it looks okay. We're pretty happy with that. If we needed to, we could actually uh, go in and modify it. So we're pretty happy. Well, I'm pretty happy with that sort of an elliptical shape. So we finish our sketch just like that. And our next step is we want to actually make it into a solid block. So we're going to do something called extrude. So it's often a good idea just to, just to tip it a little bit. You can see how the whole plane sort of changes. It's like tilting a piece of paper away from you. So rather than looking down on the piece of paper, we're now sort of like moving it so that we're like looking off the side of the table. And now we're going to extrude it. Now, because this is the only thing there that's actually on the plane, it's it knows to extrude this. Under other circumstances, you've got a whole bunch of other things here on your platform. All you could do is just click on the thing on the on the sketch that you actually want extruded, and it will just take care of that. So it comes up with this little box. So we've selected one profile. A profile is just the outline of our shape. Profile plane just means you know, where it's actually being drawn. Direction. Now, one side means we'd only want it in one direction. But because we want this nice and symmetric, we're actually going to hit the symmetric mode down through there. Measurement. Now, we're going to work out how thick we want this to be. So if we have this, maybe we might want to make it, oh, maybe about something like, three mils each side. Now, as you pull up, it can get a little, you can get these funny little like 2.848. We have two ways of actually saying we want it to be six mils thick altogether or three mils either side, or we could make it even smaller. We can make it like 2.5. We can either just enter 2.5 into there and it will adjust it automatically. It also changed it over here. You also have the option, you could have just typed in 2.5 here or even in through this little section here and that will let it do it. This means it's creating a new body. Now we want it to mean the body is, is the actual physical object. So we hit okay. And there we've pretty much got, and if we actually just look at the front, there's our, our side view. And there's our top view. So it doesn't look terribly locket-like at the moment. It looks a little blocky. Mm -hmm. So what we're going mm -hmm. to do now is we're going to round off those edges. Now, that's where we come up into the modify section here. So we're going to, we have two choices. We can fill it in. And it's usually whenever you click on these things or even just hover over them, it gives you a little box describing what it does and what it will do to your object. So there's fillet, which will round off your corners, and there's chamfer, which will square them off and actually provide like a flat surface, and you can modify what angle that's at. So we're going to fillet it and try and make it nice and round. Another little dialog box, which you can completely ignore, uh, you just click on that edge, and we click on that edge. So there are two edges. It should actually say two edges have been selected. You can actually say what radius of curvature you want, but I find usually it's easiest just to kind of just go in and go, yeah, I kind of like the look of that. That's, that's nicely rounded and you can just leave it there. If you push in too far, it'll give you a big error message because weird things will happen to the, to the geometry. So you go, oh no. So if we go about there and we like the look of that, and we're not actually getting any error messages. So let's go with that. And we just go, okay, if you want to, if you like nice round numbers, you could just change that to 2.4, just so that you know, it's a nice even number. And we've rounded that off. So that's pretty much what our closed locket will have as a profile. So fairly round, 
not too bad. Nice flat surface on the top if we wanted to add a cloisonne or we wanted to put some initials or any other detailing or engraving that we want to put on the top there. Now, the next bit that we're going to do, you'd think would be just to split this in half to make just to make the two bits. And you'd be right. But before we do that, we're actually going to hollow out the inside. So obviously we don't want to lock it with just, just two solid chunks of metal because that's not going to hold a great deal at all. So we're going to hollow it out once again up to the modified little menu that we've got here. And there's one here which is called shell. So as it says here, it removes material from the interior or you can do it from the outside. So we're just going to click on that. It asks you to select the body that you actually want to shell out. And sometimes you might just want to tilt that. We go, yeah, that guy. Inside thickness. Now, this will be where you work out how thick do you actually want the walls to be, like one millimeter, 0.8 of a millimeter. I'm going to make it relatively thick. So let's make it like one millimeter. So we'll make it one millimeter and hit OK. And we're going to be going, OK, uh, so did it do anything? Easiest way to tell what's going on inside one of these things is you can hover over it and it'll give you like a little bit you can see in there it's been hollowed out a little. Not so easy to tell. We can use something in the inspection palette over here. So in here we've got something called the section analysis and what that does is it provides cross sections so you can always tell what's going on. We want it to be crossed over through here. So we pick our plane and look, we've got a cross section and that tells us it's all nicely hollowed. If we actually have a little squiz in here and actually round it up properly with the front, we can do little measurements and go, yeah, that's one millimetre thick. I can see that that's one millimetre there, that's one millimetre and that all looks pretty good. So that's all fine. Now this analysis will, will stay in the program. If we want to go back to looking at our normal thing, we just turn it off. But it means that any time that we want to double check that things are happening the way we want them to on the inside, and we haven't got things overlapping, which are going to bind up once you actually cast them and things like that, we just go straight into our analysis and just double check it. Now we get the joy of actually splitting it. Another tool, split body. Now, a good way to do any of the sorts of splits is to actually use a plane. Now, this is a really good reason for actually creating it nice and symmetrically around our normal plane. So, we are going to split this, going there. We want this body to be split. Over here in our side menus, if I actually open this up, we can see we've just got one body, this great big lump here. Now, the splitting tool we're going to use, very hard to see the little planes in here. What we can do is just turn the little eyeball off. So this is a little eye, which means this is visible. So if I just turn the body off so I can see my planes, I want our original sketch plane that we drew. Now, it's going to make this little red thing. Red generally means it's cutting something. Now we're going to put the body back and hit OK. Now what we will notice is we've got two bodies. We've now got a top and a bottom. So here's my top. Well, no, actually let's decide to do the bottom first. Well, that's great. And that'll be the top body. If you close one off and just make it non-visible, so now we can look down and there's the inside of our locket. So we can see it's nice, it's open. We can look at the walls. We may decide later, well, yeah, we want the walls to be a little bit thinner. If we wanted, if we look at it at this stage and go, yeah, those walls are just a little bit thick. You'll notice that down here, it's actually given you a list of all the things that you've done. If I wanted to change the wall thickness for all of my pieces, all I'm gonna do is go back into here, hit edit feature, and we can change it in here. So if I wanted to change that to 0 0.8 instead, let's say I wanted a thinner wall, change it to 0 0.8, hit OK. 
and we've got a thin wall. So it's not quite so, so heavy. We go, yeah, I think I like that better. Or we may decide that, yeah, you know what, that's going to be a bit dodgy when we actually go to cast it. Maybe, maybe we'll turn that back. So you have two choices. We can either go back into the edit and change it back to one. Or our other alternative is just to go control Z and you'll notice that it thickens back up. So control Z is your go-to for whenever you go, ah, that hasn't gone well, I'm going to undo that. So that works in most programs, just the old control Z. It's everybody's friend, particularly when you're using things like Word, which, or any office application kind of thing, which really are the invention of Satan. So we've now got our two bodies. There's our two halves. The next step is going to be, we're going to need a hinge. Now, when we're actually doing this in metal, we'd be thinking, okay, so the hinge, let's, let's hinge it off here to the left. Let's make it probably, uh, well, we could make it six millimetres long. We could make it a little bit longer than that. So let's say we wanted to make it there. What we're going to do there is we're going to use something called, now it's hiding down here, a pipe. So what the pipe does is, uh, well, as it says on the, on the pack, it makes a pipe. You can make the cross section round or triangular or square. Obviously we're making a hinge, so that's going to be a circular cross section. And we're going to lay it down through here. Now, the thing is with the pipe is it actually needs a pathway. So we're going to have to do another sketch to tell it where it's going to go. So that will go from there to there. So let's do another sketch. Looking at the top, we want it to be on our flat plane like everything else. So create another sketch. We tell it that we want it to be in that plane now. Sometimes once again, the bodies do get in the way. So let's just turn them off. We want it to be on that plane that says, sure, off you go. And let's turn the bodies back on so we can see what we're doing. We're going to create a line down the side. So there's our line application there. So it's this little guy here. And let's say I want it to be going from there. So that tells me that that's six millimeters there to there. So that's nice and symmetric. And we just click on that there. Sometimes it'll try, it'll, it'll try and be helpful and say, oh, you're obviously drawing a square. We're going to try and do another one for you from that point. Just hit escape and it will go away. It's sort of a bit like um, like Clippy in Word, that little annoying little paper clip you used to turn <laughs> up and just go, no, go away. So we're just going to finish that. There's our little pathway for our hinge. We're pretty happy with that. That's symmetric. Now our next bit is making the actual hinge. So we go, can I have a pipe, please? And it's going to say, what path? And I'm going to say, I want it here. Now, things that we're going to have to remember. Normally when we're doing a hinge on the side, on the side of a locket, as those of you who, who are already jewelers or already silversmiths, you have to actually make a channel for that to sit in. So we're actually going to be doing this twice. The first thing is we're going to cut the rebate. So we're going to cut the little pathway in the side of our, of our piece. We're going to make this a, let's say it's going to be a 1.6 millimeter hinge in diameter. So we're going to cut out our section first. You'll see how it's actually given us this option. It's assuming that we're going to do a cut later on we're actually going to create a new body. But there's other options that we've got in here. You can join it, you can cut it, you can intersect it, all those sorts of things. We're just going to make a cut here. And if we actually turn our piece, oh, look, there's our, there's our little rebate, which is already in there. So that's all nice and ready. And this will certainly make life a lot easier for us. Now, notice how the sketches run off again. That's one of these little eccentricities is that it will always, once you've actually done the job, it says, oh, you won't need that anymore. It just turns it off, it's still there. So we're just gonna put the eye down there again. Now we're gonna make our actual hinge. So having cut the rebate, 
Now we use our pipe. I want that pathway. It remembers that the last time we did this, it was 1.6. So it's in there, it's circular. We actually want it to be hollow so that we can put our, our hinge wire in there later. Now the section thickness says, well, this is how thick the walls of the pipe are going to be once we've actually put the hole in. So you can see it's like a little tiny hole there. So 0 0.4, that means that it's got room for a 0 0.8 wire. So that's not too bad. Now, it will often say, obviously, this is right next to this. You must be wanting to join it. Don't join them at this stage because we have to cut that little pipe up into three pieces for our hinge, which was no, it, just a matter of getting out the, 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 the saw when you're doing it in, in reality. In this case, if we actually try and cut those hinges, it'll cut across both bodies. So it'll cut like great big lines through the middle of our locket and we'll end up with a three-piece locket, which isn't really ideal. So what we're going to do is say, yeah, let's just make it just a separate body for the moment and that'll be grand. Hit, hit, okay. And let's turn those sketches off so that they're out of the way and the origin. So what we can see there is we've got, there's our, there's our pipe. We want to check the analysis to the cross section so we can see, yep, that's definitely in there. That's all happy. You'll see this has actually got an outline because it's got a separate body. Later on, once we join the hinges up, we're going to see those outlines vanish as they actually become part of what the, the top or the bottom piece. But for the moment, we can just have a little squares. We hit front just to make sure it's lined up and go, yeah, that's, that's not too bad. So it's about a 0 0.8 wire that we're going to get in there. So we're pretty happy with that. We have a look at the sides. That's not too bad. And we turn it around, make sure there's nothing weird happening. That all looks pretty good. Okay, so turn the analysis off. There we go. So now we come to that next bit which is going to be actually cutting our hinge into three pieces. Now, as I said before, when we're actually using um, a cutting function, usually it's best to use things like a plane. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna turn these guys off for the moment. We don't wanna look at them. We just wanna cut this guy up. So we're gonna to need to create other planes. First of all, good idea to have a little bit of a think to yourself where exactly you want your, your hinge to be cut. Same decision that you make all the time when you're going to be doing this in the reel. So usually because this is oh, 12 millimetres long, maybe we'll just make each of these uh, four millimetres long. So four mil, four mil, four mil, that all sounds okay. It seems like a plan. So going to construct an offset plane. Now that just means from a standard plane, we're going to make one just off from that. So we're gonna hit that little guy. The plane that we want, we so far we've been working with this one, the facing one, but seeing as we actually wanna cut across, we actually want it to come from there. The next bit that is going to say is how far do you want that plane? You'll see how we've got that little yellow red, little line moving up and down. That's telling us where our crossing plane is going to be. Now we want it to be at the four millimeter, the two millimeter mark, I think. Because remember that we want it to be the four down from there, two there, two there, four there. So this way it's all in the right place. So Let's just make that two millimetres up from ground level. We go, okay. There's our little plane. Now, often a good idea to stretch them across. So we know it's definitely going to be doing its cutting. Now we're going to need another one of these guys over here. So we can make another offset plane. This time we want it to be based on that one. We want our new plane to be four mils away, down through here. It says minus because we're going down. 4.0 and okay. So now that I have these two little planes in through here, now I can cut my hinge. 
note that I've taken these other bodies out of the way just to be on the safe side. But because we're only acting on this one plane or this one object, see, body to split, now I have the option just selecting that one. And it doesn't matter if the guys are here or not, it's only going to split that body. If for some reason I wanted it split all the way across here, I could just click on those bodies that would do it. But we just want the hinge. The splitting tools, I'm going to select that plane and that plane. And then we go, OK. All of a sudden, oh, look, we've got extra bodies. So bottom of the hinge, top of the hinge, middle of the hinge. So those are all just where we wanted them. We're all pretty happy with that. Let's take the planes out. There they are. And if I were to close that off, there are those hinges. Now we have to work out, all right, now that we've, now that we've got our hinges in place, just like we normally would in silver, we're going to attach two of the knuckles to one of the, one of the halves of the locket and the single knuckle to the other. Which way you go is up to you. I'm probably going to decide to take that central knuckle and attach it to the top piece. So looking at that one, it will underline, if you've selected one of these guys, you'll see it underlined. So that tells me it's body five. You can also rename these just to keep track of things. Like that's body one, and that's actually the bottom. So just click on that and we can just go bottom. I can make this the top, just to keep track of what everything is. Now we can make that little guy there and we can make that, we'll name all these guys. We could say that's um, knuckle three, something like that. Knuckle three, knuckle one, inadvertently set me into one of the shortcuts. So knuckle one, and we can call that one knuckle two, just for a little bit of imagination there. There we go. Plonk that in through there. Now we've named everything. So let's do- Tony, I'll just take this opportunity just to invite people if they've got questions, just to ask them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If anyone's got a question, just pop them up. Of course, if uh, you can always watch this later as well and just stop at any moment and just go, oh, what did she do there? And you can always get, uh, get in contact with me too um, through AJS and my email uh, and just ask. You know, I'm more than happy to, to try and explain um, the weirdness of whatever I'm doing. So and your remove... contact details are in the comments as well. Excellent. Awesome. So if people want to contact me and just say, why on earth did you do that? Then you can find out. Uh, I'm going to hook that, that middle knuckle up to the top. So I'm going to just, just silence him for the moment. Now I'm going to join that guy and that guy to this one. So up here, we've got combine. So this glues things together. The target body is the main thing you want to do in the piece. So let's make that the target body. The tool bodies, the things we're going to be gluing to it are these two. So we go, yep, those, and we want them to join. Now watch what happens here the moment that I hit join. Now I've just got one body which is made up of all these sections. So now it just recognizes it as one single piece. We also have a look and see where that little rebate is there. We've still got that rebate, which is just waiting. So once this is actually being cast up, it means that the knuckle of the top is just going to slide in there. So it'll be able to slide through and past without binding. Um, this will be very familiar to those of you who've ever had to make a locket in just in metal. This is a lot faster and requires less burning and swearing when you actually 
like accidentally solder all of your hinges together or is that just me that'll be just me and there's that guy now let's see what we've got going here so now we've got the top one let's just get that out now we've got our top guy now we want that middle knuckle soldered onto our top got to do exactly the same thing so combine target body is going to be our top we can just click on him tool body that one so once again you can click on it here or you can just click on it directly in here we're going to join them and now we're back to just having a top and a bottom and they look like that so Carney, once they're joined they're joined you can't undo that unless you do just the control z you can't well, actually, you uh, you actually can. If you come back into here and roll back the setting, it goes back to being here. So if I wanted to undo it and say, no, 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 I want to change which way I want the knuckles to go, you can either roll back the history at the bottom of the screen here, and then it says, okay, it's like a redo, and see how our knuckles have reappeared. Our other alternative is to go back into here, into the history, and you can edit the feature, and where it says your tool bodies, you may decide, no, I don't want them to be the ones which are soldered. I want it to be like knuckle two. You can change it over. So it, it, nothing is final in this, mm -hmm. which is a very good thing. So we're just gonna cancel that. We just want to leave it alone. So there's our hinge done. So once things are all ready, if we wanna actually see just if that's all working, we can rotate this around just to make sure so this is a move function. Let's say I want to move that top body around this axis just to see if it's working. So there's our different bunk things we can do. If we want to move things apart or move it to a particular point or do combinations, there's all of our move buttons here. The axis, I want it to move around there. And oh, look, it's given us a little rotational handle. So what we can do is open it up. And go, very yeah. exciting. Wow. Woo! And we're pretty happy with that. That all seems to be okay. What we can also do is turn the analysis tool on and watch what's happening in here. And there's nothing weird happening. We don't have any pieces crossing over. So, so if, if it was to go in this direction, you can see how you start getting these little crossovers. So obviously that's not the way it's going to go, but just look out for little weird things in the topography there. You'll also notice that because we joined the hinge that that little line that was in here, when we earlier did our section analysis, it's vanished. It's because of these, it now thinks this is all one piece. And that's just what we wanted. So let's turn our analysis off. That's all good. And we can actually cancel this just to make it all one piece again. This is having a think. There we go. So we're all happy. What we're going to do now, of course, is something I should have done earlier, and that is actually save it. You can have auto save on. I'm just going to call this um, locket. Um, locket piece demo. There we go and save it. Now this does have a tendency to do an auto save, but just to be on the safe side, do do a save as soon as you can. Really, I should have done that back here. I'm very, very naughty. I should have done that the moment that you do your first sketch, just do a save and it will keep on updating it all the time, which is one of those great functions, Scott. Now the next bit that we're going to need to do is we're gonna to need to make our little housing for our clasp. So let's do this through the top. Let's just get this out of the way. So I'm okay, going to just want before to... you go there, I've just got a little question from uh, Amy. Yeah. They yeah. Said, I, might, I might have missed this. Uh, how often do you use Fusion or a CAD program in your work? Well, I never used to use any of these things. Um, I was, I was like, I'd, I'd either do it in silver or I would be a wax carver. But uh, I've got a degenerative eye condition and now it's getting much harder for me to, to do waxes and to carve um, 
to carve wax. So what I've done is I've learned all these CAD programs. So now I think almost all of my sculpture work is now done in CAD. And if I wanted to make a locket or a ring, my first go-to now would be doing it in CAD because it's much faster and um, it's not as much strain on my eyes. The good thing is I can hook my laptop up to like a little projector and I can make this the size of my wall and I can see every detail um, and not have to worry about all the, all the blind spots which I've got in my retina. So um, at the moment, I would say easily... 85, 90% of the work that I now do is done through using CAD packages like Fusion 360. The other one that I use is ZBrush, um, which is through Pixelogic. And that's where you can do more figurative work. It's like molding clay. So you can make little dogs, you can, you can carve little people, you can do all sorts of stuff. But for the geometric stuff, Fusion 360 is my go-to. If it's anything that's geometric, go to Fusion 360. If it's anything sculptural, which needs uh, like human faces or bunches of grapes or whatever you want to do, go to something like ZBrush or Blender. Um, their Blender is an open source one. It's absolutely free. It's very powerful, but it's also very, very hard to navigate and there's a big learning curve on it. Um, ZBrush, a little, little easier. There are books that teach you how to use all of these things. And yes, there's books for Fusion 360 as well. But Fusion 360 is out of all of out of all of these sorts of like geometric programs, by far the easiest that you that you're going to find. It's much easier to use than things like Rhino Gold and a lot of the other jewelers things. And it allows you to do some very strange things in here as well, like spirals and all sorts of stuff. And it's well, like I said, did I mention you can get free versions? or at least extraordinarily cheap, which is a lot more than you can say for like things like Rhino Gold, which is fine, but yeah, depends on how many pennies you've got. And I have very little pennies. Thanks, so, Patty. Uh, Hamish also asked, okay, what's your next step after you complete your CAD? So what do you do then? Ah, the next step after we've completed it um, is then to convert it into a file which can be read by a 3D printer. You can convert it to STL or OBJ. I will be showing you how to do that. Um, and then once you've got it in that in that format, you can send it to a three. If you happen to have a three D printer, like um, like a Flash Forge Hunter, like I have, which will actually print it into wax, rather than me having to carve it in the wax, and you send the wax to a foundry or cast it yourself if you had the facilities. Alternatively, if you don't have any of these things. You take the STL and you just send it electronically to somewhere like Palloys or Peter W. Beck or Chemgold or Pure Casting. All of the casting houses these days will have a 3D printer, which allows them to print off a wax and then it gets cast into the metal of your choice. A lot of these casting houses will also, if you ask, just print it off in wax and send it to you so you can inspect the wax before it actually gets turned into metal to make sure that you like it. It's cheaper to do it that way. Um, rather than having to cast into metal like silver and get it back and go, oh, that doesn't quite work. Oh, well, that's not what I wanted. So it, it can be a little bit uh, frustrating. Um, because I have a Flash Forge Hunter, if I've got a piece and I want to know what it's going to look like in the reel, what I will do is I'll print it off in plastic first, which is nice and cheap, and then make sure that it works and then make the, make the run into the, into the wax. Wax is just a little bit more expensive uh, as a resin than, than the plastic is. So yeah, there's, there's steps in all of these things. But when in doubt, you can always just go and find a friend who happens to have ooh, a 3D printer, and there's lots of friends who are getting them now, um, and that's worthwhile. Thanks very much, Kanye. Mm -hmm. Well explained. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to be making our little circle section. We need it to sort of pop into here. So we're going to make a little, another little pipe, another little cylinder, which we're going to pop into here, or we can just make it go all the way to the bottom of the surface. And we're going to pop it through here. That's going to be what's, what holds our little rare earth magnet. Now, I know that my rare earth magnets that I get are two millimetres in diameter and one millimetre deep. So that's pretty much the size of the little tube I'm going to make. Now, another way that we can do this is just to actually make the little profile and just make a little body of it. 
and we're going to pop him in there. So guess what? Yes, it's going to be another sketch. Hooray! Sketch number three. We want it to be on our main plane. So everything's nice and symmetric and we're going to draw it in here. So I can have it. There we go. Now let's have a squeeze. I'm going to need this to be two millimetres. So if I just pop them in there, just to start with, there's my two millimetre hole that I'm going to need. So I'll pop that there. Now I'm going to need some metal around that. So I've got two things I can do. I can either do another circle around the outside and maybe make it about there, make it three mil, something like that. And that you'll notice that that's going to extrude into there and then it's going to pop down. So there's our sketch. That's pretty much what we're going to see when we look down. We may decide to move the whole thing over into here, but just for the moment, just for our preliminary locket, this is where we're going to put it. So finish our sketch, happy with that. Now we're going to do our extrusion and we're going to drop him down. So we are going to take that profile and that profile. We're actually going to make a solid tube and we're going to run that all the way through there. Now see how it automatically wants to cut. We actually want it to be a new body. We don't want it to cut. We just want it to be like that. And if we want to see what it's actually doing, we can have a look at it here and see how we've got that going just a little bit in there. I want to come just a little bit short of that. There we go. And we've popped that there. And we're fairly happy with that. We go, that's all good. And our next step will be, let's take the analysis off. We turn, see how it's turned that sketch off? And now we make the hole. I want that hole to be one millimeter deep. Do an extrusion and I'm going to drop that down. And I want that down one mil. So remember it's negative because it's going down. We go click and we do another little click and we're pretty happy. This time we do want it to cut. We're pretty happy with that. And there it is. So let's have a little squiz. We've got it like that. That's all ready. Okay, now the reason that we made this a separate body is to make our life a lot easier. We don't have to do it again in the top. So let's turn on the analysis so we can see what's happening from the side. Remember, this is a separate body that we've got in here. This is called body six at the moment. So let's turn off all these little sketches so we can see. So this little guy here is going to be our housing. We need another one just like it up here. So we can use a mirror. So what we can do is mirror. Now, we actually want the body to be mirrored. I want that object in there, body six. And the mirror plane that we want is going to be our main plane that we've been doing all of our drawing on. So that little guy there. Now hopefully I've selected the right one. Nope, I haven't. Damn. So click. There we go. Let's just twist him around. And I want that guy. There we go. And we can see we've immediately got it appear up in the top. We don't want them joined together. That would be very bad. We want it to be a separate body again. And OK. So it's going to have a little think about it. And now I've got two separate little bodies in through here. Like we did with the hinge, we want to join this one to this body. I've left them in the cross section. It's just a little easy to see what they're doing. So we're going to do our combine. I want that guy to be joined with that guy and joined. Okay. See how it's all vanished. It's all hiding in there. And now I'm going to do another one. I want to combine that one with that little guy and join them. 
So now I've got my two parts again. You'll see that this little bit in here seems to be missing. That's actually like an artifact. So it, it will actually come out true because this is all nicely mirrored. You do occasionally get these odd little artifacts turning up. Now, we, if we want to double check what's happening, that's all pretty good. And now our last step will be making, once we've done, turn off the analysis. There's our locket. And our next little bit is going to be that we're going to want to put like a jump ring or something like that on the top. We're going to make it a fairly simple sort of a jump ring just here. Um, just because we're, we're running a little short on time here. Let's just get the, um, the top piece out of the way. And we're just going to stick a jump ring on. And the good thing is that we've got a jump ring function. Well, it's actually a torus. There it is. And we want it to be, let's put it on that plane for the moment. We're going to put it about there. Now it's a fairly large looking little jump ring that I've got there. That's a six millimeter jump ring. Ooh, that's probably a little bit big. Let's make that smaller. Let's make it four. Something like that. And the diameter of the torus, which is actually that the jump ring there, so we can make it one, we can make it 1.5. Once again, we don't want it to cut, we want it to actually be a new body. The reason I make it a new body is just so I can move it around. I may decide to join it up, I'll just have a little look. Yeah, see how that's sitting a little high, which is going to be a bit of a bit of a pain in the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're just going to move that, move that jump ring. Drop him down level. Have a little look at it from the top. Oh yeah, that's not too bad. And okay. So there's our jump ring on the top. I might actually drop, make that, uh, move him a little bit further south. There we go. So he's in there, that's okay. You'll see how that's starting to intrude a little bit into there. Now we can do is we can cheat. We can cheat like a bugger. So mm -hmm. what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna cut that jump ring. So that jump ring, and I am going to use our original sketch. So there's our little outline, let's cut that. And let's see if he actually lets me do that. So now I've got this little section in here and we've got this little guy in here, which we don't want. Right click and remove. So now I've just got this jump ring, which I'm now going to attach to the bottom, which we all know now, we just hit combine, target body, and I'm going to attach him, join them up. And there's our section. So now I've got two bits, a top and a bottom. I'm going to move that one out of the way so you can see what we've actually got. Move that one. Axis around there. Open it up and that's what we've got. Sometimes a good idea too, just to separate them out a little bit like that. And we save. And now I'm going to turn it into an STL file. And all we do then is export it. We are going to make it, we can make it an OBJ. These are all the different things you can make it. We want it as an STL because that's the most universally accepted by most foundries. And we can save it in the cloud drive. Always a good idea to put it somewhere where you can access it. Don't hide it internally. There's our docket. It'll save and export. It's going to convert that and it will give you like a little menu in here. And that will usually take like about a minute depending upon the speed of your system. So it goes externally and it does that. So once that's done, then you just take your file and you'll open up things like Palloys and you just, uh, it'll say drop your file in and it will give you a quote. 
and that's pretty much the way that it works. So in this one, I've actually got a slightly more intricate little, little bale up the top, which I designed by just doing this little profile from the side. In fact, if I show you the sketch, I think he was sketch seven or was he sketch six? Yeah, I can't remember which way, there he is. So that little sketch in there, I just sketched that out, thickened it up, and then I just rotated it through to get that little shape. So they all work the same sort of a way. What I've also done on this one, you'll see there's an extra line there. And that's because I've made another little, like just like I made the rebate for the hinge, I made a little rebate here, just so that you can actually get your thumbnail in um, to be able to uh, open up your locket. And you can do that over on this side too. It's never too late. We can always just go through here, drop down another line and make another little rebate. Usually we just make it on the bottom. So if we're desperate, oh, another sketch, just something different. And drop, drop in a line, doesn't have to be very long. Let's make it about that. Something like that. There we go. Finish the sketch. And we're just gonna pull that out. Want it to be that path. That looks a little bit over enthusiastic. Let's maybe just make it 1.2, something like that. Okay, and now I've got a rebate that's cut there on the side. So that once Beautiful. they're actually all joined up, yeah, once they're all joined up again, we've got that little rebate just in there, which once the piece is all together, it means it's going to be a lot easier for somebody to be able to get their thumbnail in and just flick it open, which is a lot easier to get into than like, if you've actually got a little clip in here, which is the traditional way that we tend to close lockets. Um, a lot of people, if they've got nails, it's fine if you don't have any nails at all, it becomes very difficult. And this, you just need the bare minimum of nail and the rare earth magnet will separate. Um, it's also, uh, it, but the thing is with the, with the rare earth magnets is they're really quite strong and they hold it together really, really well, except the moment that you give them a little crap, they'll just flick apart. So it's, I've, I've been wearing uh, the silver version I made for probably about a month now just to just to play test it so to speak and it has not flicked open without me putting my thumb in there once so it hasn't accidentally opened at all so it's a, not a bad way of going about it and if you'd oh, like to just stop sharing your screen and um just absolutely. Show, show people that finished piece that you've got there well not quite yep. finished but um oh well it yeah, there we go and so there's our silver locket and there we go and you can see i've put my hallmark there on the side um that's another really good thing about this is you don't have to worry about trying to stamp the darn things is you just put it into the program as an svg it just this is another sketch and then you just extrude it downwards and it cuts it into the surface and i assume so, Carney, each piece that you do becomes a template for future work it does yeah, indeed. So do now that I've got that locket, I can now put, if I want to put people's initials on, it's really trivial to put the initials on and then somebody else's initials, I just change the sketch and print off another one and then do change it again, print off another one in wax. Before you know it, you've got like eight lockets all with different initials in the front and it's a very, very fast process. Um, you can be more, more artistic and put like do more sculptural things. But uh, what I would then do is if I wanted to make it more sculptural or do a very, very loose sort of um, like an engraving style, what I would do is I would take the top of the locket, I would then import it into ZBrush and then use ZBrush, which is a very, very like working with clay and then do a design in the top, which might be a little face or something like that then export it back out. So you can mix and match between the programs. You can pull things from one and bring it into another. Yeah, no, uh, Carney, you're an amazing educator. You've done a great job today in explaining all that. So thank you so much for your time and your trouble. If there's any final questions or comments, we'd appreciate them from our audience. Otherwise we'll uh, call it a wrap and we'll look Absolutely. forward to seeing you back in the future, Carney. That'd be really wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, from uh, Hamish, thanks, Carney, for sharing, and thanks, Peter, for hosting. It's our pleasure. No worries. Okay. Uh, until next time, Carney. We'll Absolutely.
Bye. Bye, everyone.